Hey folks, um, this is the sixth lecture. This is uh, going to be on logarithms, well, actually the graphs of logarithms and, and things about the properties of those graphs. Um, let's get rolling. I <laughs> uh, wanted to talk to you a little bit about you know the, the general setup here. So if you think you've got an exponential function, a growth function, or it could be decay, um, there's that's basically saying there's a connection. Uh, there's a, a way of hooking x, the input variable, and the amount of something together. It's, a, it's an exponential function. But, you know, the, the diagram, the black box diagram kind of thing is what, like we had before, is, is what you should think about. Now, in that scenario, and, and this is true whenever you have that sort of a input-output diagram, you've got two sorts of ways to, to talk about it things, direct questions and indirect. And I'm going to mention both of them, but let's talk about the direct thing first. It, um, it basically says, take, you know, if you know a value for x, tell me what a is. So tell me what value a will have when x is blank. Fill in the blank with your x value, then you can fill in the blank with the output value. The indirect kind of questions look like this. Um, you've got a known output that you're trying to achieve, right? And you ask, well, what value of the input, what value of x should I use to produce blank as that value of a? So you know the output and you want to and you want to figure out the input. So um, yeah, direct questions are super easy. If you've got a direct question, you just you just sorry, I'm fixing my framing a little bit. Uh, you just plug in, right? If you know what x is, plug it into the formula and it'll tell you what uh, the value of the output is. The, um, the indirect questions are tougher. And what happens then is you have to first set up an equation and then solve that equation for x. And generally, that's going to be easiest if you've got a way to invert the functions that are involved, if you can you know, do a reverse process. I'm going to give you an example of that using squaring and square rooting. But what we really want to do is talk about this for exponential functions and their inverses. So here's the the first example. You've got a um, you've got a circle whose radius is x. That's the the um, input value. And um, yeah, so the formula for that is is easy enough. Then the area of that circle is given by pi times the square of x, pi, pi r squared, you know, that formula. So here's a, an example of a direct question. Uh, what's the area of a circle if it's got a radius of 5 inches? And yeah, you just plug in 5 for x, and you get the area at when x is 5 is pi times 5 squared, and I did it in, the, in GeoGebra, but you get around 78.5 square inches. So here's a typical um, indirect question. It's asking you to figure out what the radius would be that would give you a circle of area that's known. In this case, I said 100 square inches. So what you have to do to do that is first set up an equation. Now, where I wrote a of x equals, that's, that part is normally skipped over. You just write the formula for whatever the thing is you're interested in. And then it becomes pi of, times x squared equals 100. Now, um, that gets us quickly to, um, let's see, just divide both sides by pi. So x squared is 31.83, and then finally x is 5.64. Just notice what happened from here to here is you used the square root function. You had to take the square root of 31.83 to get that, because you had x squared and you wanted just x. That's the inverse of the basic function we're dealing with, where the basic function is x squared, we needed its inverse to solve one of these indirect questions, or sometimes called inverse problems, because they involve using the inverse function. All right, so let's talk about the inverses for exponentials. The, uh, the first one we're going to learn about is called the common logarithm, um, and it's written like that, L-O-G, like one word, a little three-letter word, log x. Uh, that's the inverse function for 10 to the x. Um, so that means this, if, if you've got an x value and you stick it into the exponential, that is what I'm saying here, 10 to the x, comes out with some number y. 
then if you take the logarithm of that output, you'll get the input. So if y is 10 to the x, then the log of y will be x. You see how it just sort of switches input and output? Here x was the input, y was the output. On the logarithm, it looks like the y is the input and the x is the output. But those are really equivalent sentences. Um, a lot of people use this little mantra, logarithms are exponents. If you just think of logarithms as being exponents, you will most likely uh, be able to work your way through most of the problems. Okay, so then once, once you've thought about the logarithms, oh, you know what, let's do a quick example of some of that stuff I just did. If I, if I wanted to know what the logarithm of 1,000 is, what I would need to do is think of 1,000, think of 1,000 as being the result of an exponential. It's 10 to the third power, right? So what goes here? What goes here in log of 1,000 is that three. That's an easy ex, uh, example of it. You basically go, all right, what power should I stick on 10 to get this number I'm looking at? So another example, if I wanted the log of 1 million, what power should we stick on 10 to get a million? That's pretty easy, six. Um, you can even put numbers that are smaller than one, like what is the log of 0.1? What power of 10 is 0.1 or 1 tenth? That's actually the negative first power, so log of 0.1 will be negative one. You can verify all of these on, on GeoGebra if you wanted to. So the next thing to think about is logarithms that give us inverses for other functions, not just 10 to the x, but some other number, b raised to the x power. And um, those are denoted by putting a little subscript on it. So you still have the word log, and you put a, whatever b is down low, and then the log of base b of y equals x, that means that y is b to the x. It's very much a correspondence in, in the other thing. Um, rarely you'll see people say log with a 10 as the subscript, um, because log with a 10 is the same thing as log with nothing. So it's, it's sort of unnecessary, but occasionally you'll want to do that just if you've got lots of bases floating around, emphasizing the fact that the, the log you're dealing with right there is, is the 10 power one. Okay, so, um, oh, before we push on, I want to show you in GeoGebra what do those logarithm functions look like. Let me pop open the GeoGebra. Um, actually, oh, I've already got it open, but uh, here's the normal screen. If you, if you click the one that says f of x, you get a bunch of different functions that are reasonable inputs for uh, well, for the, for the system. Um, where is LOG? Oh, there, it, it actually writes the LOG with a 10 subscript on it, but I believe when you use it, it actually just, let's get the thing out of the way so you can see it. Yeah, LOG, it does put the 10 subscript in it. That's pretty non-standard. Um, all right, well, that's what it does though. Um, if you want a logarithm to some other base, you see this one that has a little, like, dashed square region in the subscript zone. Oh, sorry. I didn't really mean to do it that way. Let's let's back up over that stuff. I was taking the log of the log or something, which would look a bit weird. Um, like if I wanted the logarithm base two of something. I'm going to put in something here. How about if we put in 32? Nope. <laughs> I got to put the cursor where you want it. Logarithm of base 2 of 32. Can you guess what that'll be? It's actually already written there for us. 5. Why is that? Well, the logarithm is generally the, the question that asks, what power should I stick on the base to get me this number? So you have to ask, what power on 2 would get us 32? And sure enough, that's 5. 2 to the 5th is 32. All right, back to the, uh, the other view. So um, there's this other logarithm that's kind of special called the natural logarithm. And it's, um, it's written with the letters L and N, LN. Usually, I often at least write it in cursive. I think depends where you see it. You sometimes will see it in, in 
cursive, other times not. Um, but it's the inverse function for e to the x. You could write log with a subscript e like that, and, and that would be fine, I suppose. But the, the fact is, we've got a special notation for that logarithm, so this is preferred, and this would be not so much. Uh, people would know what you meant, but it would, you know, they'd look at you funny. All right, so now we're going to go on to talk about properties of these functions, these logarithms. And uh, the basic way to think this through is that any property you know about exponents is going to translate into something about logarithms, because, you know, logarithms are exponents, the, that little rule I, I mentioned. So the first thing I'm going to play with, show you about, is a property of logarithms that maybe it's, go, I'll go ahead and write it out for you. Uh, it's that the logarithm of the product of two things, I'm going to use x and y, is the logarithm of the first thing plus the logarithm of the second thing. Um, by the way, if you, if you have the log thing followed by a single entity, you really don't need the parentheses, but I kind of like to write them anyway, so... I may sometimes leave them off, but they're, they're sort of redundant if you've, if you've only got a single thing appearing after the log. Okay, so why would that be the case? Well, again, think of logs as exponents. Then um, what happens when you multiply things that involve exponential expressions? You add the exponents. Remember that rule? So this is what we're going to try to convince you of, but it really comes from this, that if I have my base to the x power and my base to the y power multiplied together, that will be base to the x plus y. Um, I think that might, if you, if, you, if you don't feel convinced of that or don't feel comfortable with that rule, think of it this way, or as an example. Suppose x is 3 and y is 4. Then x to the, or b to the third power is is b times b times b. And b to the fourth power is b times b times b times b. Four b's, right? So what's b to the three times b to the four? It's three b's, b, 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 times four b's, b, 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 b. How many b's do we got all told? Yeah, that's b to the seventh. And so notice that when you when you multiply two things that have the same base and different exponents, you end up just adding the powers. All right, so that's that's the exponential rule that we're going to look at. Um, how does that turn into a logarithm thing? Uh, to set that up for you, I'm going to in introduce something that I think is a convenient notational way of dealing with shut put. It's it's not the way they do it in the book. I'm going to use uppercase letters as regular numbers and let's say just values, right? And the corresponding lowercase numbers or lowercase letters are going to be their, their logarithms. So if you, if you want to think of it as, in terms of one of those input-output diagrams, the, the log function is the, the black box, and a capital X is going to go into it, and what will come out of it is a lowercase x. Or it could well be a capital Y and a lowercase y. So what does that mean? Uh, well, I mean, let me, let me write it in terms of logs. It says that capital X, if you apply the log function to it, gives you little x. And same thing, if you take the log of capital Y, that'll give you little y. I'm just using that convention so that we can write things really conveniently. Um, both of these facts have corresponding facts that say that are in terms of exponentials. So if you, if you take the log of big X and you get little x, then if you take the power of little x, you'll get big X. Okay. And <laughs> the, 
what's the corresponding thing with y? If you take the base to the little y, you'll get big Y. All right, so remember what I'm after here. I want to prove this rule, that log of the product is the sum of the logs. So we're going to first look at the log of the product of two values, capital X and capital Y. By the way, the typical thing is that the logarithm makes a number smaller. Although, yeah, that's the way to, one way to think of it anyway, um, which is why I was going from big X's to little X's, or big Y's to little Y's. Well, okay, so log of X times Y is, using what X and Y are there, that's the log of B to the little X times B to the little Y. And there, here, now I'm going to use that property of, of uh, exponential expressions. That's just the logarithm of b to the x plus y. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. I've done something kind of sloppy here. I should be putting b subscripts on all these logs. We're talking about the logarithm base b. So, in fact, we're doing something in general for all different base logarithms at the same time. The reason I, I realized it when we got to this point is I wanted to say, well, what is the logarithm base b of b to the x plus y? If that had been logarithm base 10, I couldn't even tell you. Because it's base b, and I've got b written to a power, and logarithms are, are exponents, I, I just pull out the x and the y. How's my framing looking? Yeah, it looks fine. All right, well, what is... What are x and y? Remember where they came from? x was the log base b of x, big x. Maybe, maybe I can say it with my voice. x is the log base b of x. No, that's not funny. Yeah, so what we've got there is the log base b of big x plus the log base b of big y. So overall, what I did is turned the logarithm of a product into a sum of logarithms. Um, one way to think about that, and I, I like this way of thinking about it, is the logarithm made the operation kind of one notch easier. If you were multiplying, the logarithm will turn it into adding. If you were dividing, can you guess what logarithms would do to that? Probably. <laughs> I'll just go ahead and write it for you. I'll say the rule. We don't need to go through the whole rigmarole of explaining how it all plays out, but here's what the rule for logarithms of quotients is. If you have x divided by y quotient, that's the logarithm of x minus the logarithm of y. That makes, I hope that makes good sense, right? If multiplying turns into adding, then dividing ought to turn into subtracting. Inside, dividing inside the log versus subtracting outside the logs. Um, there is another rule that we're going to be asked to look at, which is how do you deal with powers inside of logs? So if you have the logarithm of x to, I used a number for this before. In my notes, I used a number for this. How about a, x to the a power? Because we haven't used a's yet, but b is in use. So <laughs> I just want to watch out for what letters have I already gone after. Logarithm of x to the a, well, to figure this out, ask yourself, what is x to the a? Um, I'm using the same convention I did before that, oh, and these bloody logs are all base B again. Should make sure I have, have those subscripts on everything. Anyway, uh, x to the a means you've got b to the little x raised to the a. And again, you can use a property of exponents. If you have a base to a power and then you raise that to another power, you end up multiplying in the in the powers. I could I could show you a way to think about that too, but it's 
it's pretty it's pretty straightforward from knowing that that uh, multiplying turns into adding because raising to a power is multiplying over and over again and what is adding over and over again multiplying so you see that this this one makes sense in terms of the other rule all right so great so I'm, I'm asking for the logarithm base b of x raised to this power, but that's the same thing as the logarithm base b of what we just wrote down, b raised to the xa, with the product there in the, in the exponent, and that is x times a. That's careful, that's little x, right? And that's, that's still just a. And this is, I'm going to write it the other way around, a times x instead of x times a. This is the number a times the logarithm of capital X. So overall, this rule tells me that the logarithm base b of a power turns into a product. So it does look like the operation got one notch easier, a right? power turned into a product. But there's a little bit of an asymmetry in things here. The, um, the power ended up out front as just a multiplication factor. And the, the thing uh, that was the base of the power expression still is inside the logarithms. So the, the overall, it looks as if you, you could just do this. You have logarithm of, uh, well, let's stick with x to the a. It kind of just looks like that a popped out front, right? And disappears from in there and appears out front as a multiplication factor. In other words, in a certain weird way, it looks like you can just pull out the A or factor it out. What we're really doing is taking advantage of this rule of exponents to say something about the uh, logarithm of a power. Okay, so we've got, uh, let's, let's do a quick review. We had the logarithm, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna write log because this is true for every logarithm. It doesn't matter what the base is, as long as you use the same logarithms on both lines. The logarithm of a product ends up being the sum of the logs. The logarithm of a quotient is the subtract the logs. If I have a base to a power, so I'll use x to the y power, um, the power looks like it pulls out front. Um, finally, there's a thing that we need to, to talk about. This is the last property. It's called the change of base formula. And what is it? It says that if you have the logarithm to some unusual base that you're interested in computing, you can just use one of the more standard bases. So, for instance, you could use log base 10, or in other words, just plain LOG. Take the base 10 logarithm, but then scale it or divide it by, excuse me, the logarithm base 10 of the base you're interested in. And if you get all the way to 10, that's the logarithm base logarithms. 10. It's a pretty it is ln um, of steeply X growing. I'm sorry, by I'm by just saying the, the wrong thing. That's the exponential function. Base so, so that's so 10 to the X. These um, this change of base formula this would, would be, be the case back here. That would be I'm going to turn this back to 1.1 to GeoGebra. No. <laughs> Having a so bad day. Right on the, on, on the screen here, here myself. Let me start so, over. I don't remember how to delete things. There it is. Hit delete. Um, I've got a, a, a setup already of the function b to the x with b controlled by a slider here. So that the initial value is 1.1. But you can move it to different values. If I bring the slider all the way to this end, the base of the exponential expression is 10. That's 10 to the x. If I move the slider to the other end, I've just changed the base of the exponential to 1.1. So we're, now it looks, oh, it's, it, GeoGebra is actually saying it for me. See what it says right there? 1.1 to the x now. So I'm changing which function it is by adjust, adjusting that slider. Let me turn on this other guy, which do you notice how I've used the logarithm with the subscript thing in it? Uh, it's no, it's a blue graph, and that's the logarithm base b of x. So how are these 
green and blue graphs related. Well, watch that they, they they stay related as you as you fiddle with the slider. They have a a continuously. Um, I mean, the, the, they they always have the same relationship to one another, no matter what the value of b is. But it's a little bit maybe hard to guess what that is. If I throw on the line y equals x, I think you'd be more inclined to see it. They are mirror images in that line, and that's kind of the, always the case with inverse functions. Not quite sure why I said kind of. That is always the case with inverse functions. Inverse functions are mirror images in line y equals x, and it's because, uh, well, the inverse of a function is literally obtained by interchanging y and x. All right, so we've got logarithm base funny bases. Let me turn off the exponential for a sec and just plot the, the g. Just plot the, the logarithm. As I change the base, what never moves on here? Can you spot it? What's happening is the point right there at 1, 0 is always the same point, no matter what the base is. Yeah. So um, it's not obvious at first. Oh, the domain is always zero to infinity. That's a, that's fairly easy from the picture, right? You don't have any graph over here in negative x territory. It's got an asymptote along the negative y axis, and that is there whether we've got a high value of b or a low value of b. They always head for there. And this spot one zero is never moving. What it looks like is you're just rescaling. So if I took, let's fix b to be, I'm going to try it for 2. There we go, 2. I could compare that to the plain logarithm of the, 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 uh, the unadorned logarithm function, the log base 10 of x. And you should notice that the log base 2 is just the log base 10 scaled by something. All right, well, maybe you can just see it visually on, on what remains of this graph. The logarithm base 2 is just a stretched out version of the logarithm base 10. It's just the same thing, but made taller. That's it. That is, you can do a vertical scaling to make the logarithm base 2 out of the logarithm base 10. That said, let's say what the logarithm base 10 change of base formula is. See that this, this piece that I've just written right there, it looks like you took a factor, 1 over the logarithm of b, and you times it by the logarithm of x. So this thing here, 1 over log b, that's the scale factor that converts log base 10 into log base b. It's not the same, but there is also a scale factor that turns ln into log base b, and it's 1 over log natural log of b. All right, I think that's a good place to call it a day. So uh, have a good one.